Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 25. And then, boys and girls up to the sixth grade are welcome to go downstairs if they like. 1 Samuel chapter 25. I'm going to ask you this morning, define for me the perfect woman. I can describe it in one word, Debbie. For me. It is interesting to note that down through the centuries, our definition of a perfect woman has very different connotations and very different definitions, if you will. I'm going to start this morning. I'm kind of continuing a thing somewhat series. We're talking about people that came to, to God. But I, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to start really a series kind of this. People in the Bible that are often overlooked. People in the Bible that are often overlooked. And um, it's, it's kind of the same idea, people, that we would look at and say, well, I, I didn't know anything about them or how, how did they come to God. This morning, I want to talk to you about a woman that I believe is, I think, one of the most special, precious, and fantastic ladies in all of Scripture, but one that we don't often speak up. And again, if I were to ask you to define the perfect woman, some of us would probably have a little different definition. Many of you have heard of a fellow by the name of Tevi. He's a fictional character. And Tevye talked about his description of the perfect woman was a, a proper woman with a double chin. That was a proper rich man's wife with a double chin. There are tribes in Africa that believe that a perfect woman has a long neck with rings sitting on top of it. There are, there are many people that have this definition of what a perfect woman is. But I wanted this morning, I want to define for you a little differently. I, the Bible talks about that a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. And this morning, I want to talk about this lady. Now, her name is Abigail. Abigail. Now, Abigail is not a name that we often hear about or talk about in church. And so let me, let me give you a little bit of background about the situation. You know, it's the idea of the rest of the story. How many of you miss Paul Harvey? I miss Paul Harvey. And, and, and I mean, you can still hear him online, but, but he's, he just, that, that phrase, and now you know the rest of the story. There's just something about the stories that Paul Harvey would tell. He always found, um, I don't know about you, but sometimes I get tired of listening to news. Because every day it said, do, do y'all know the, the, the phrase that, that uh, publicists use? If it bleeds, it leads. Look at your news. The more graphic an event is, the closer to the beginning of the newscast they put it. The more vile it is, the closer they put it to the front page. It's hard to find good news. It's hard to find good news and good events. And this morning, I, 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 I want to give you the, a good news. And like I said, Paul Harvey was one of those guys who delivered it. And so I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. Now, David was king at the time. Or excuse me, was not king. Saul was king at the time. And David had been selected to be the next king. Now, David was a great man. I love David. And one of the reasons I love David is because David was real. Okay, Am I, have I lost everybody already? David was real. He was a real guy. I, I mean, God, God told not just his good things, but God told some of the things that he did that were not so good. Is, anybody else in, is there anybody in here that's perfect? Okay, I'm just double checking. Anybody want to say they're perfect? All right, anybody close to it? Yeah, some guys are hitting their wife going, yeah, raise your hand. You're next to perfect. Some of y'all will get that later. All right. Nobody's perfect. As a result of us all being sinners, right? We're all sinners. Sometimes we look at Bible characters and sometimes even the impression that God is only interested in people that are perfect. That's not true. If you're here, if you're listening to my voice and you somehow think that God is only interested in perfect people, somebody has fed you a bill of goods. Because you know what? The Bible says, for God so loved the world. And the last time I checked, all the world are sinners. Every single one of us in this room has done something, multiple things that we ought not do. And so when God tells us about David, God tells us the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, David was running from Saul. Saul knew that he was going to be the next king. 
And here in 1 Samuel chapter 25, David is literally running for his life from King Saul. He's been hiding in the mountains, and at times he's been fighting battles, protecting the land of Israel. But in 1 Samuel chapter 25, he and his men, they're tired. Samuel has died. And I think it's the first verse you'll find in 1 Samuel chapter 25. Samuel the prophet dies. And David and his men are hiding. And as a result of their hiding, they didn't have the ability to get food. And so what David does is he sends some of his men. He heard that there was a great wealthy man by the name of Nabal. Now Nabal was a shepherd. The Bible tells us he was a very wealthy shepherd. And as a result of that, David said, look, if I send my men down there, surely Nabal will be willing to feed my men. Now, we live in a generation, a time, that you have no problem feeding people that you know. But especially in the Old Testament days, it was counted very discourteous if somebody showed up at your house and you didn't feed them. How many of you like old Western movies? How many are like me? I like old Westerns. And if you ever watch an old Western, you'll see that some cowboy rides up to a house he's never been to before, right? He rides up to the house he's never been to before. He gets done off of his horse. He says, howdy, ma'am. Woman walks out and says, oh, my goodness, what are you doing here? He says, well, ma'am, I've been riding for a long time, and I was just wondering, is there any way that I could get some vittles? Oh, sure, be glad to. And she invites him into the house, and she makes him sit down, and what does she do for him? She cooks a meal for him, right? Come on, so y'all have watched old westerns, haven't you? Isn't that, what they, isn't that what they did in old westerns? That was reality. That's what people actually used to do. Right? That's what people used to do. How many remember your, your grandparents telling you about that somebody was just passing along, and they, and they let him, and they actually didn't just cook a meal. They brought him into the house. How many of you had grandparents or great-grandparents that actually let a stranger stay in their house overnight? That used to be commonplace. If you walked up to a house as a cowboy and said, ma'am, I've, I've, been, I've been journeying a long way. Is there any way I can get some, some vittles? No. <laughs> that was rude. That was rude. You didn't do that. You always took care of strangers. Where did they get that idea from? It came back from Bible days. Because in the land of Israel, that was common. If somebody came up... Now, David knew that Nabal was a wealthy man. And David had 600 men. And the last time I checked, it takes a lot to feed 600 guys. So Nabal didn't just go to any... Or excuse me, David did not just go to anybody. He knew that Nabal was a wealthy man who had lots of sheep, and he thought, surely if anybody can feed my men, it's going to be somebody like Nabal. But David doesn't go himself because he doesn't want to overwhelm Nabal. He sends some of his young men. Look, if you would, here, and let's just, I'm going to pick out some verses because we're getting to Abigail. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 25. It says, and there was a, a man, verse 2, in Maon, whose possessions, okay, 1 Samuel 25, 2, who were in Carmel, and the man was very great. And he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now, the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife was what? And I like this. Read the next two phrases. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. And I'm going to tell you why I like that. Look at the order. Look at the order in which it was given. You know, our culture today, they don't care about a woman's character. They just care about how, they, how she looks. Right? I'd rather, have, I'd, ha I'd, I'd rather have a woman with great character first. Now, that doesn't mean that beauty is not something that's, that can be important but we live in a society that has put so much pressure on young women to try to be the standard of beautiful. Can I, can I encourage you, young ladies, that are, if there's anybody listening to me, develop your character. Develop your character. 
We have some, we have some, we're, we're living in a generational time that we have so much attention being paid to the physical outside that character has been left in the dust. You have women that are more concerned, and men too. They're more concerned about their looks than they are the character of their heart. My dad used to say, beauty is skin deep, but ugly goes all the way to the bone. And what he was talking about was the character of people. You can see some woman or some man that he's, he or she is very good looking, and yet they have the character of a stump. Look, I'd rather have children and people that have character than to spend all their time worried about their beauty or their good looks. God says, look, this, is, this woman, Abigail, she was a woman of good understanding. Now, she did have the bonus. She was looking. I mean, she was good looking. She was an, a beautiful woman. But I want you to notice, look at the latter part of verse 3. Look at her husband. But the man, her husband, was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. Now, matter of fact, later on, he's actually called a son of Belial. Not only by his servants, but by his wife. And so we have this situation, David, look at verse 3, or verse 4, it says, And David heard, the wilderness, heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. And David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Go you up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus shall ye say to him that liveth in prosperity, Peace be both to you, and peace in thine house, and peace be unto all that thou hast. And now I have heard that thou shearest, uh, thou hast shears. Now thy shepherds were, were, uh, which were with us, we hurt them not, neither uh, was there aught missing unto them all the while that they were in Carmel. Ask thy young men, and they will show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes, for we will come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants and to thy son, David. Now, let me, let me give you the context of what's happened. David has sent these ten young men to the shearers of Nabal. And he's saying, we're asking you to go to your master and please have him prepare us. We, we, let him know that we have been around you this entire time. We could have, we could have taken anything we wanted by force. But that wouldn't have been right. And so we're coming and asking, will you please feed us? Will you please take care of us? Now, I'm not sure about you, but that sounds pretty reasonable. Especially when you are, as the Bible calls Nabal, a great man, very prosperous. So let's skip down to verse 9. And it says, and when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David. So now they've gone to the shears and now they've been brought to Nabal. And it says, they, they, they said the same words to him. And verse 10, and Nabal answered David's servants and said, who's David? Now, by the way, who is David? He's the next king. Who is David? Who, who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? Can't you hear the sarcasm in the tone? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from their master. Ooh. Now he's accusing David of being anti-Saul, anti-the king. Look at verse 11. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh, my meat, if you will, that I have killed for my shearers and given unto men whom I know not whence they be? So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him, David, if you will, all these sayings. And David got mad, rightfully so. It wasn't just the fact that Nabal had turned them down. It was because it was the way that Nabal turned them down. David says in verse 13, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And there went out after David about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. 
But the men were very good unto us. And we were not hurt, neither missed we anything as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the field. They were a wall unto us, both by night and day, all the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. In other words, he was saying they were there not to hurt us, but to what? To protect us, to shelter us. Verse 17, now therefore, this is the servant still speaking to Abigail. Now therefore, know and consider what thou wilt do. For evil is determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such a son of Belial. How would you like to be known as a son of Belial? Now, if you don't know what the word Belial is, it's the, it's, 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 it literally it, it, is an, it has to do with demonic, demonism. It basically was a false god. He's a son of Belial. He's a son of the devil. A man cannot speak to him, he said. Then look at verse 18. Here's where I, I, let me, I got three points. Number one, I want you to see the situation was difficult. I've already kind of given that. Second of all, I want you to notice that the husband was devilish. The situation was difficult. The husband was devilish. He was an angry man. He had an angry heart. He accused David of being rebellious. Now, now for those that don't know the story, for those that do help us out, was David rebellious against the king? No, as a matter of fact, David on several occasions had an opportunity to actually get rid of the king, and he didn't. He protected the king. I, I love the fact that one day David, because you've got to remember, David's going to be the next king after Saul, and Saul is sleeping in a cave, and David and his men are in a cave. And, and, and they're in this cave, and, and Saul falls asleep in the cave, and David goes down and cuts off the hem of, of some of the, the cloak of Saul. And then afterwards, David felt guilty about it. He felt terrible. And he cries out to Saul from a distance. He says, oh, Saul, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have cut your, shouldn't have cut your skirt. I shouldn't have cut the bottom of, the, of your robe off. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. You got to remember what was Saul there to do. Saul was there to kill David. That would be like me going up to some guy who's got a gun in his hand. He's trying to shoot me. And I kick him in the shins. And I go, oops, sorry. Now Saul had a conscience, fortunately, because as soon as he recognized that David had cut off the hem of his garment and he could have killed him, Saul stopped chasing after David. David was not a rebellious man. He was not a rebellious man at all. Now, we could say a lot about that, but I don't have time for it. But he had an anger. Here you have this man, this this man that, uh, a that Abigail is married to in Nabal, he's a, he's a devilish man. He had an angry heart. He had a selfish spirit. What were David and his men asking for? Just some food. Just some food. And what does the Bible say that Nabal was? He was a prosperous man. Could he have afforded it? Absolutely. Matter of fact, later on, his wife Abigail takes food out to them in abundance. Sure, he could have afforded it, but he was a selfish man. If you look in, ver in, in verse 11, see if you can notice a word that's used quite a bit in verse 11. Anybody? I'll let you get your chance to read it. My. Yeah. Again and again and again, he uses the word my, 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 my. Folks, do you know that anything that you and I have is actually only on loan from God? Do, do you not recognize it? you not recognize that even the very breath that you and I breathe is on loan from God? Look, if, if, if God so chose to withhold the breath from you and I, we're, he, we're not going to stop him. Everything that we have is, a, is a, on loan. You know, my kids, they are not my kids. And no, they don't belong to Hillary either. Amen. Or the government. They're God's. They're on loan to me. And even some Christian people, well-meaning Christian people, have lost perspective of that. Your children are not yours. They're God's. God gave them to you. How do I know that? Because sooner or later, I want them out of the house. And I say that tongue-in-cheek because I want them to be what God wants them to be. They're not, I can call them my kids. Folks, this isn't my church. This is God's church. This isn't my church. That car that you drove in here, you say, well, it's not mine, it's the bank's. 
How could you afford it? Because God gave you the strength. My, see, Nabal thought everything was his when it wasn't. He was a selfish man. He, was in a, he had an angry heart. He was a selfish man. And then notice his reputation. Look down at verse 3. The latter part of the verse, it says, but the man was churlish. This is Nabal. He was churlish, and he was evil in his doings. Do you know that even, even, and remember this. Remember he was a prosperous man. Even, even people can sometimes be wealthy. Don't you dare equate wealth with blessings of God all the time. Because there are a lot of wicked people that are wealthy. Skip down to verse 17. Okay, same chapter. It says, now therefore no one consider. This is a servant speaking to Abigail. He says, now therefore no one consider what thou wilt. For evil is determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such as the son of what? This is the servant. Now skip down to verse 25. Now we hear what Abigail says. Now she's in front of David, which we'll get there in just a second, but let me just show you her words. She says in verse 25, Now my Lord, this is Abigail speaking to David, Now my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of... Fellas, how'd, how'd you like your wife? That's what she thinks about you. Now by the way, you know why she thought it about... You know why Abigail thought that of Nabal? Because it was true. Because it was true. Look, fellas, just because you bring home the bacon does not make you a good man. Just because you bring home the bacon does not make you a good man. When you have a reputation like this, there's something wrong. Let me tell you something. This Nabal... I have no idea how he got Abigail. But I'll tell you this, he was a blessed man. He was a blessed man, and he didn't even recognize it. Well, he was taking care of the daily needs, but he was a son of Belial. He had a devilish reputation. He was a success financially, but in his family, he was a failure. Brother Townsley yesterday taught toward the end of this session. He taught about how to be financially free. And he basically made a statement to this regards. He said, you know what? He said, I'd rather be poor and have a good family than be rich and have my family fall apart. Okay, do I need to say that again in English? How many people, that they, they, they're so concerned about their finances, yet their family's falling apart? I'd rather have a house with little that has God's blessing on it than have a house filled with more than I need and my wife and family not respect and love me and love the Lord Jesus Christ above all things. This man, Nabal, was not, he was a devilish man. The situation was difficult. The husband was devilish. But I want you to notice, last of all, Abigail was a delight. Abigail was a delight. Look at, look at verse 3, verse 1, or chapter five, 25, verse 3, the first part of it. 1 Samuel 25, 3. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife Abigail, and she was, there it is, a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. She was a woman of character. See, that's the first part. See, the word of good understanding, that means she was a woman of character. You say, well, how do you know she was a woman of character? I'm so glad you asked, because I'm going to tell you. And if you didn't ask, I'm still going to tell you anyway. Look down at verse 14. Now, remember what the situation is. Okay? David is coming toward Abigail and, and, and Nabal in their house. And what's he getting ready to do? He's getting ready to basically take now everything by force. Okay? And in the process of doing that, what do you think is going to happen? People are going to die. People are going to suffer. Because Nabal decided that he was going to keep all this stuff. So what does Abigail do? She faced, first of all, she faced the truth of the situation. Look down at verse 14. 
It says, but when, but when one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. But the men were very good unto us, and we were not hurt. Neither missed we anything, as long as we were conversant with them. When we were in the fields, they were a wall unto us, both by night and day. All the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now therefore, no one consider what thou wilt do. For Eve, what thou wilt do. Okay? He, you know what the servant recognizes? Nabal's not going to do anything. Abigail, we need you to do something. For evil is determined against our master and against all the household, for he is such a son of Belial, and a man cannot speak to him. Look at the first part of verse 18. Then Abigail made haste. Then Abigail, in other words, she put herself to what? To action, yeah. She wasn't, she wasn't waiting for her for her husband who'd failed. Now, now let, me, let, me, let me give you a couple things to think about. The Bible makes it very clear that men are to be the, the heads of their homes. You can say amen to that. That's, 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 that's biblical. It's okay. I'm, I'm not throwing something out that's unbiblical. God told men they're, 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 we're to be the heads of our home, right? That's what God said. What do you do, ladies, when your husband doesn't take the family to church? What do you do when your husband does not lead your family in Bible reading? What do you do? Well, you can get bitter, you can get angry, or you can take action. And you can talk to them and try to see if they will take. Then you can also say, look, if you're not going to take us, I want to go. If you're not going to lead us in family devotion. And by the way, you can say that without having a bitter spirit. You don't have to have a bitter spirit to say something. Um, recently I was, we were, uh, we went, we, y'all know we like roller coasters. And uh, we were on a roller coaster here and, and there was a guy about 10 rows in front of my wife and I and he had his cell phone out on the roller coaster ride like this, taking selfies of himself in the ride. I, 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 got, I got a little upset. And I'll tell you why I got upset. Because last year, I watched a girl come into the train station at a, at a music park with her front teeth knocked out, holding a phone in her hand because some numbnoggin halfway up the car had decided they were going to take selfies of their roller coaster ride and had let go of the phone. And it came back at the speed of the roller coaster and hit the girl right in the mouth. And she's sitting there Blood flowing out, front teeth are gone from a cell phone. So I'm watching this guy. He's in front of my wife, about 10 rows. And I've got my hand. I couldn't, I mean, I, I got my hand. I wasn't telling my wife, look, there's a guy up there. I just had my hand up ready just in case. We get off the ride, and I went to one of the guys before we even got out of the car. I said, look, that guy right up there, he had his cell phone out. And he's like, oh, which one? And I said, that one. He said, oh, okay. And he didn't do anything. So I walked up to the guy, and I, I, as he's walking up, I walk right past him. I said, look, you had your cell phone out. Well, I put it away. I said, you had it out. And the employee kind of got, and I, I got a little frustrated. And I raised my voice. Afterwards, I felt bad. Because I shouldn't have raised my voice the way that I did. I didn't yell. I said, look, it's not, he's, he's sitting there laughing. I said, it's not a joke. It's not a joke. It's serious. And I looked at the employee and I said, you need to take action. You need to do something. Because the next time he's on the ride, if he lets go of that phone, somebody is going to get hit and they're going to get hurt. You need to take action. Well, what am I supposed to do? I said, I don't know. Find out what the protocol is and do something. He said, what are you telling that for? I'm telling you, Abigail wrecking, she was in panic mode. Her household's about ready to be overrun by David and his men. And her husband was the cause of it. Now, I'm not trying to say to women, look, don't honor your husband as the head of the home, but don't let your family be destroyed because of a wicked husband. Come on. Am I right? Don't let a family be destroyed because of a husband. Look. Be a woman of God and take some action to, pre to look, stand up to him. And ultimately she does, which I'll show you in just a second. 
Well, she's to be submissive. She's to be submissive to God first. My wife, when I'm, listen to me, and you may not like this, but I've got scripture to back it up so you can take it up with the author. When I'm doing wrong, my wife has every right to stand against me. When I am disobeying this book, she has every right to tell me I'm doing wrong. Well, she's to be submissive. There's a difference between submission and slavery. Abigail was a woman of character because she took action. She knew. She faced the truth of the situation. She didn't just back up and say, well, you know, it's not a big deal. She recognized it was a big deal. And then she faced the truth about her husband. Look at verse 25 of chapter 25. She faced the truth about her husband. What does she call him in verse 25? You know what Nabal's name means? Nabal's main name, his name literally means fool. That's what the word Nabal means. Nabal means fool. Now, whether his parents gave it to him or whether he was renamed somewhere down the line, I don't know. But his name literally means fool. It's like the name Len Charlotta means anchovy. <laughs> the word Nabal means Fool. She had to face the truth about her husband. She called him what he was. She said she did not act as if he was. You know what? Sometimes it's hard to admit that we have a problem in our home. Am I right? Isn't it sometimes to admit and when we have a problem in our home, it's hard to admit it? She faced the truth about her husband. Then I want you to notice in verses 20 to 24, not only was she a, a woman of character, but she was a woman of courage. Look at verse 20. It says, and it was so. She gets together a bunch of food. David and his troops are coming. And in verse 20, and it was so, as she rode on the ass, that she came down by the covert of the hill. And behold, David and his men came down against her and she what? Picture one woman riding out to meet 400 armed soldiers. And she's taking them lunch. That's courage. That's courage. That she was a woman of courage. See, she took responsibility to protect her household. Verses 18 and 19, she tells the servants, look, this is what I'm going to do. Then in verse 20, she actually goes out and she faces these individuals. She faces. Now again, you say, well, these are just David and his men. Okay, hold your finger here and turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 23. Let me tell you what these, these men had just got back from doing. In 1 Samuel chapter 23, David and these men defeated the army of the Philistines in 1 Samuel chapter 23. It says in, in verse 20, or verse 20 or chapter 23, verse 2, Therefore God, excuse me, therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Kilah. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more shall it come to Kilah against her, Kilah, against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Kilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thy hand. You know what God does? He delivers them into their hands. The army of the Philistines is beat by these 600 men. These are the same men that one or two chapters later, Abigail is now standing in front of. And what are they coming to do? They're coming to basically take by force. She faces David. That's a woman of courage. I think we live in a generational time where unfortunately the women's rights movement have confused courage with selfishness. Can I say that again that everybody understands it? 
The women's rights movement of our generation has confused courage with selfishness. Because they are two different things. Look, selfishness is saying, I'm going to abort a baby because I can't be bothered. Courage is saying, this child may have birth defects, but I'm going to love it anyway. That's courage. Selfishness says, look, you know what? We need three cars and we need a big screen television. And so, you know, I'm going to go to work and we're going to put the kids in daycare. Courage says, you know what? How about we buy an old used car that runs so that maybe I can spend time at home with the kids and they don't have to come home from school to an empty house. Now, folks, I know that's not popular today, and I'm not saying that a woman who works outside the home is somehow outside the will of God. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that we need some women to recognize that courage is not following the women's rights movement. That's not courage. Courage is is protecting the family. It's protecting a marriage. It's protecting the character and the testimony of God. She was a woman of courage. And then last of all, she was a woman of compassion. Look, if you would, here in 1 Samuel chapter 25, beginning in verse 25. Now, I I don't have time to read all of this, but let me just give it to you in a capsule. David's army comes. Abigail basically says to David, please be merciful. Be, Be merciful to us. Beginning in verse 25. It says, let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Bilal, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the men of my Lord whom thou didst send. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood. In other words, God's been merciful. Now listen to this. Here's what she says. God's been merciful to you in not killing us. You say, what does that mean? How many of you have ever had somebody that used to have the ability to drive and then as they got older, they lost the ability to drive? What would have happened if your mom, grandma, husband, wife, or whatever, if they had lost the ability to drive and they had hurt somebody in an accident? How would they have felt afterwards? They would have preferred for themselves to have been that's what she's saying. She's saying, David, if you, if, if, you, if you, God has been merciful, you haven't killed any of us yet because you didn't know the whole story. And for your sake, I'm glad because when you know the whole story, I think you would have regretted it. She was saying, I know you're a man of character. You'll find it later on. I know you're a man of character. And had you done harm to us, you would have regretted it. She says in verse 28, I pray thee therefore, forgive the trespass of who? She doesn't say, forgive my husband. You cannot be responsible for somebody else's wrongdoing. You cannot be responsible for somebody else's wrongdoing. But you can ask God to forgive you for your own. She says, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. You know what that phrase says? Abigail knows who's going to be the next king. She says, David, you're going to be the next king. I know that, and I'm okay with that. But the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life for the Lord, with, uh, with the Lord thy God and the souls of thine enemies. Him shall God and the soul, excuse me, he, them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. You know what happens at the end of this story? David doesn't even bother, does not even bother Nabal. Nabal's drunk. Let me just quickly finish this story. Abigail comes back to the house. David has has been placated. He and his men depart back up into the hills. Abigail goes into the house, and there's her husband. Passed out drunk. I told you he was a son of Belial. He's passed out drunk. So she doesn't tell him what's happened. Even though, what you know what she's just done? She's just saved his life. She's just saved his life because who do you think David and his soldiers would have taken out first? She just saved his life. But he's drunk, passed out, had a big party. Finally, 
A couple of days pass. He sobers up. She tells him what he's done. The Bible makes a very interesting statement. I want you to see something here. Can I show you one verse and then we're done? As far as looking at Scripture, and then I'll close with the final end of the story. Look at verse 36. It says, And Abigail went to Nabal, and behold, he had held a feast in his house like the feast of the king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore, she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. And it came to pass in the morning, when the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife told him these things, that his heart, see that? His heart died within him. And he became a stone. You know what that was? Help you out. If you don't, if you don't get the story, he was so humiliated that his wife had to protect him. That he withdrew, and the Bible tells us that 10 days later, he dies. And that's not the end of the story. I'll give you the Paul Harvey moment. David hears that Nabal has died. Now you got to remember, who is going to be the next king? He's going to be the next king. David was so impressed with Abigail. He was so impressed with Abigail, he says, I want her to be my wife. And you'll find later in the chapter, Abigail marries David and becomes queen. Abigail was a godly woman. Now, it's a woman that many times we don't, I mean, we don't, it's a story that we don't, if we don't, sometimes we don't think about. We've heard the name Abigail. I believe Abigail was one of the greatest women in all of Scripture. Yet she's hardly known by many people. She was a woman of character. Now, there was a good blessing, I'm sure, for David along the path. My wife is not perfect. She'll be the first one to say that. She, just like me, has made mistakes. Both of us at times, I'm sure, have hurt people and done things we ought not do. But I know this. I know that I know my wife loves the Lord. I know my wife loves me, loves our kids. She cares about people. And God gave me a bonus that she's good looking too. That's what Abigail was. That's what Abigail was. Hey, hey, hey you, you young guys that you're not married, you know, a box can look good, but it can still be empty. If you don't get that, let me say it again, and maybe I'll have to give a little explanation. You can wrap up a box really nice that it looks good, but it can be empty. That girl may look good, and there may be nothing inside character-wise. Young lady, can I ask you a question? What do you want to be, good-looking or a woman of character? By the way, become a woman of character, and one day one guy will look at you and go, that's a good-looking woman. Abigail was a woman of character. And I think it's something we need to consider. Father, we ask your blessing now upon these thoughts. Lord, I know this was not a salvation message, but I believe it was a challenge that we all needed to recognize. Lord, we're living in a generational time, especially right now. Looks, slenderness, athleticism has become synonymous with beauty. And yet, Father, we have young men and young women that have no idea, and, and not just young, but even older, that have no idea about character, about the willingness to stand and do what needs to be done. Thank you for Abigail. Thank you, Lord, that she was willing to view the situation as it really was, that there was a problem that she needed to deal with that she told her husband the truth, that she had the common sense to make sure that he was in a position to be able to understand it. 
that she did what needed to be done, even if that meant going out and standing in front of an army of men and saying, David, please forgive us. We didn't know what he was doing. Be merciful because you, you would regret hurting people and then later finding out that it was just, just one man that caused this. Lord, thank you for her testimony. Lord, I pray for every young man in this room that they would not settle for any young woman solely because she is a pretty package. May they look for a woman who has character above all things and that beauty that that woman has will be magnified by her character. And so, Lord, I pray, for the, I pray for the young ladies that may be listening. Lord, even those that are young, for moms, for grandmas, may they encourage their children and their grandchildren to become men and women of character and not just of good looks and athleticism. Lord, thank you for Abigail. Thank you, Lord, for her testimony, for her love for her country. We didn't even have a chance to get there. Lord, she knew that there was a division in the nation, and yet she knew that David was the man to unify things. Lord, what a woman of character she was. Lord, help us to learn from her lessons. I ask and pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. With her heads bowed and eyes closed, let's stand together, if you would, as the instrument begins to play. I know this was not a salvation message. I understand that. And so let me just say this. Salvation is by grace through faith. It's not of good works. Abigail was a godly woman, yes. She was a good woman, yes. She did good works, yes. But those good works did not earn her a place in heaven. Salvation comes by the grace of Almighty God, through Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. This was a character study message. It was a message that we need to look at and say, do I have the character of this person in my life? Do you? Well, the first character that we need to have is trusting Christ as our Savior. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, that's you, That's you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you're here this morning, you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. It would be our joy, our privilege, our pleasure to show you what it means to come to a saving knowledge of Christ, to repent of your sins and to turn to Jesus Christ and let him save you. Yes, repentance is necessary. Yes, understanding that you're a sinner is necessary. But the saving work is done by Jesus Christ. With their heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, if you would just slip out of your seat, make eye contact on your way down here, we'll take you to a quiet place, show you from the Word of God.